David Bonson joining us right now. He's the chief investment officer over at the Bonson Group. Uh, you having fun out there, David? I'm always having fun. Markets never sleep, and we don't sleep much either. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I, we talk about the data that we've been, the economic data that we've been getting, and whether you can piece together that data and make a compelling case for what the Fed is going to do next. I feel like a lot of people have made predictions, a lot of people continue to get it wrong, and the Fed continues to stay the course. Yeah, and I do think that part of the challenge is people believing that what the Fed will do or not do is actually based on that economic data. So there's already a multivariant problem. There's different data, uh, different ways in which you can interpret the data, and then having to guess what the Fed will do with all of that. I'm of the opinion that the Fed has long ago realized that they're not the primary force here in bringing down inflation, that the inflation is a cover. It's a good cover. They need to maintain some central bank credibility. But fundamentally, the uh, housing lag is well known at the Fed. And other than the housing lag, you basically over the last nine months have gotten the inflation rate down to 2%. Um, the ongoing volatility with energy is why we have a separate reading for core and headline inflation. So I think that the Fed is essentially trying to get the excesses out in credit and housing, um, that it is not really about broad inflation, and they're frustrated that they haven't broken credit yet. And uh, it sounds like Reader said the same thing earlier. Uh, the credit markets have behaved remarkably well considering the circumstances. So watch credit and forget about a 2%. Two per, two per inflation target is kind of what you're saying. What does that mean in terms of how the economy will perform later on this year? And I bring that up because Man Group came out with a pretty bearish take. They were saying that U.S. stocks need to drop by more than a quarter from current levels to reflect a coming slowdown. The uh, portfolio manager, Edward Cole, saying markets are pricing in a, quote, spectacularly dovish glass half full view of the world. The way equity assets are priced implies a scenario of immaculate disinflation without any landing at all. So do you agree with that assessment? that equities are pricing in no slowdown whatsoever. I don't agree because I don't think that you can evaluate equity valuations monolithically. I think that the way in which utilities are priced is different than the way in which technology is, for example. I will say this, that after the dot-com implosion and the tech uh, blow-up of 23 years ago, uh, people would have loved to see some of these companies land at 40 times earnings, 30 times earnings. Um, the, the pain that Fang went through last year was not severe enough to uh, mark a bottom, in my opinion. Mm. Uh, but again, we're not really dealing with just FANG. I mean, a lot of the riskier parts, small cap, non-profitable tech did drop 50, 60, 70 percent. So I, do, I just don't believe anybody is able to predict exactly how it plays out, not just because of the economic uncertainty, but because of getting a read through to how markets will respond to economic conditions. Talk to us about, I guess, actually how you deploy uh, cash, whether it's a sort of re uh, sort of reallocating existing positions, David, or entering new positions here. Is there an opening here for that right now, or do you just kind of stay the course into whatever allocation you already have? Yeah, we have a couple names that we would like to be able to add uh, to take a position in. They haven't gotten to a valuation level that we consider a margin of safety to take on a new position. But we are certainly adding to uh, present positions. And last year gave us the opportunity to add, I believe, five new positions. And we run a pretty concentrated dividend growth portfolio. Mm -hmm. Molus is an investment bank that's announcing earnings after hours today. We were able to enter that at a very cheap level last year year. Federal Express was free money last year when we entered that position. And so that was a company that had been on our watch list a long time that got cheap enough uh, to buy. So there are names that definitely last year were afforded an entry point. But right now, as a dividend growth investor, mm -hmm. we really don't mind market volatility. We like reinvesting dividends. And the vast majority of our companies are growing their dividends. You're seeing really good results fundamentally from Procter Gamble and, and Johnson Johnson. Johnson. Even MetLife announced a dividend increase yesterday. So there's some good things happening out there. What's your take then on the use of cash by the big tech companies? Uh, their plans to buy back shares while at the same time cutting costs uh, when it comes to jobs and, of course, on their real estate, too. 
Well, I'm not an activist hedge fund investor, but I am a long only dividend growth manager. Let me give a little advice to these fang companies with huge amounts of cash. Yeah. Take a a page from the playbook of what some of the past companies did. They will either blow up capital with bad M&A or they will end up returning cash to shareholders and improving their own return on equity. And I think there is no question that some of these cash generating behemoths ought to become dividend payers. Now, they're not likely to follow my advice. It's a cultural difference more than an economic one. It's considered bad form in Silicon Valley to dare to return capital to shareholders. But it is what many of them ought to do. Some of them, like Apple, do it already, but ought to do it more. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that the uh, excess cash sitting around is a way to destroy shareholder value. They get an M&A bug and they end up doing bad deals. That's what history has taught us. All right, David, always great to catch up with you. David Bonson, CIO over at the Bonson Group.